Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Easter morning service at Hillside Community Church of 100 Mile House. My name is Pastor Clint Lang. It's April 4th, 2021. Welcome to our online broadcast. Now, as you guys may be aware, we're having two services today, and those services are going to be for uh, drive-in only. Um, but for those that can't make it, we're, we're just happy to be able to uh, send this out over the internet online. So glad that you could join me from wherever you're from. And uh, would you bow with me in a word of prayer when, as we open the service today? Heavenly Father, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to celebrate Easter. Lord, what a wonderful occasion where we celebrate your resurrection, Lord, and everything that it means. So for those that are listening on this uh, broadcast today, God, I just pray that you would minister to their hearts as we go through your word, O oh God, and as we remember the wonderful things that you've done on Easter. Lord, that it would change us, that it would encourage us and strengthen us in our spirits. And for those that may be listening today and they've never really um, given their lives to you, God, I just pray that today would be the day, Easter Sunday, 2021, that they would give their life to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So uh, this morning, as today is Easter Sunday, it's the day when we celebrate uh, with joy the resurrection of our God and Savior. Now, when we look at Sunday, April 4th, 2021, despite what secular society has done to commercialize this day and to promote the holiday weekend, the fact that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead is the true reason why we celebrate Easter. He has risen. That was the cry of the disciples three days after Jesus' death on the cross. But that's not the only time or, or uh, the first time in the New Testament that that phrase, He is risen, was exclaimed. As a matter of fact, that cry, He is risen, uh, initiated our Savior's path to the cross. Well, what am I referring to here? Well, you see, just before Jesus made His triumphal entry into Jerusalem, you know, the entry where they laid down the palm branches and said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, another uh, incident occurred that set in motion the events that led to Jesus' resurrection. Now, if you have a Bible with you and you'd like to turn with me to John chapter 11, John chapter 11 tells us this story. And in this passage, we see that Jesus Christ had a friend named Lazarus. And Lazarus lived in a little town called Bethany in Judea, which was about three kilometers outside of Jerusalem. Now, Lazarus was terribly ill, we are told. And um, Jesus heard about Lazarus' illness, and he didn't intervene. Now, Jesus was healing people at the time and opening blind eyes and doing all kinds of miraculous signs and wonders, but he chose not to go and see Lazarus in his illness. It was only after Lazarus had died that Jesus and his disciples traveled to Bethany, arriving about four days after Lazarus had deceased. And when he came to Bethany, Jesus was met by Lazarus' sisters, uh, Mary and Martha. Now, they were good friends of the Lord as well, and and Martha was the first one to meet him. She fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus looked at her and said, Your brother will rise again. Martha thought he was talking to her about the resurrection from the dead on the last day at the end of the ages, but Jesus told her in John eleven twenty five to 27, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. See, Martha, after she heard this from the Lord, she went into the village and told Mary that Jesus had arrived and that he wanted to see her. And Jesus and, and his disciples continued to, to Mar where Mary was. And in John eleven twenty three, 23, uh, 
1133 rather, we read this. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who were along with her weeping also, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid in me? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the, si the, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been in there for four days. Then Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called out in a, la a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. So without any doubt, the disciples and many of the people who witnessed this incredible miracle would have been shouting, He is risen! He is risen! Can you believe it? He's risen! And they'd be shouting this in reference to Lazarus. Meanwhile, I'm sure that Lazarus being raised to life, again, was creating a stir. And more people were coming to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And they would have been sharing the word, Lazarus, he is risen. Now the Pharisees and the priests got a hold of this information as to what occurred. But they were anything but receptive of Jesus raising dead people back to life. In John eleven forty six 46 and 47, we hear this, but then some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting in the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come away and take both our temple and our nation. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was the high priest for that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also the scattered children of God, to bring them together and to make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judah, Judea. sorry. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed there with his disciples. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremony cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus and they stood in the temple courts. They asked one another, What do you think? Isn't he coming to the festival at all? But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they might arrest him. You see, these Pharisees and these priests, they were not concerned with the truth. They were concerned with losing their own positions of power and prestige. They were concerned with maintaining the status quo of their religious order. The high priest Caiaphas recommended that they kill Jesus for the good of the Jewish people. Instead of letting the people rally to him and chance risking that the Romans might uh, come and destroy their whole nation and, and uh, destroy their temple. And these priests and Pharisees who were the spiritual leaders of the Jews, they were blinded to the truth of Jesus' identity. And this brings us to mind what we read in John chapter 1 verses 10 to 14, which tells us about Jesus saying, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, 
the world did not recognize him. And it goes on to explain that further. But although they should have recognized Jesus by the miraculous signs that he performed, they didn't. As a matter of fact, the ruling council of priests decided they needed to get rid of Jesus right after Lazarus had risen from the dead. Lazarus' resurrection caused Jesus and his disciples to go into hiding from the religious leaders until it was time for Jesus to enter Jerusalem. On Good Friday, we remember how Jesus, God in the flesh, died in our place to become the Passover lamb of God for the salvation of every man, woman, and child who believes and asks his blood to be applied to the doorposts of their heart. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 5.21, it's written, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the children of God. Christ's death on the cross brought us forgiveness and reconciliation. We just celebrated Good Friday and and I preached about the cross. And Jesus, had he was, he was killed. He was, he was beaten and he was killed. And he was buried in a stone-sealed tomb. But here's where it gets interesting. See, any normal man would have stayed in the grave. When human beings die, like any other carbon-based form of life, the body stays in in the grave and decomposes. But Jesus was no normal man. Jesus' statement in John 8, 58 was this, Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus made a truth claim. He was claiming that he was God in the flesh. In John chapter 1, uh, verses 1 to 4, we're told, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, referring to Jesus. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. In addition to all of what I just said, during his earthly ministry, Jesus stated something profound about himself, predicting how the future would unfold. In John 10, 17 and 18, Jesus told the people, The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. And he was referencing how a shepherd lays his life down for his sheep. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. You see, God in all of his brilliant wisdom planned out the forgiveness of sins and reconciliation for all who would accept his gift of grace through Jesus. Jesus died for the sins of the world. He was a perfect man, untainted by evil. As the substitutionary sacrifice for man, Jesus had to be fully man. Once the man Jesus laid down his life and was killed for our sins, his body was placed in the grave and the tomb was sealed. But was this the end? Praise God, it wasn't the end. Now this was only the beginning because Jesus was not just fully a man. Jesus, as we read in John chapter 1, was also the living word of God. He was also fully God. In Psalm 91 It is written, Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. The Word of God created the universe, and the living Word of God is Jesus. And from everlasting to everlasting, Jesus Christ is God. Prophetically, David indicated that God had this marvelous plan. After giving his life for the sins of humanity, reconciling those who believed in him to himself, God would not abandon Jesus to the grave. For David said in Psalm 16, 9 and 10, Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also dwell securely. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. David predicted that God would cause Jesus' dead body to be resurrected, clothed in power, victorious over death. You see, Jesus was both fully man and fully God. His divine nature could not be put to death. 
after three days, Jesus, being fully God, would raise his human body, body back to life again. Only this time, the body that he would clothe himself in would not be the same flesh and blood body which would be subject to corruption. Jesus' resurrected body would be exchanged for a body that is imperishable, glorified, and everlasting. After Jesus' death, his body was removed by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, the same Pharisee who we were introduced uh, to in John chapter 3. The two men placed Jesus' body in a tomb hewn into the rock near where he was crucified. His body was wrapped and packed in spices and a large stone was rolled in front of it. A contingent of Roman guards was placed to watch over the site and the tomb was sealed to ensure that no one would steal his body. But we see in Matthew 28, 1 to 10, a record of what happened next. After the Sabbath at dawn, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, and, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. My friends, we can rejoice today with those first witnesses of Jesus' resurrection from the grave. He is risen. Death in the grave could not hold him. The Apostle Paul gives the account of this in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, starting with verse 3, where he says, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and the apostles, all of the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. So we see the last verses of the Gospels in the first chapter of Acts, giving us the account of Jesus and his interaction with the community of believers after his resurrection. Jesus commissioned his disciples to go into all of the world and to preach the good news of his kingdom to everyone they came into contact with. The good news is this. Jesus, as our Passover lamb, has died in our place. Through his death, we have the forgiveness of our sins. For there is salvation in Jesus' name and in no other name, For everyone who truly believes and confesses him as Lord will be saved. More than this, the good news to us is that believers are reconciled so that we can have a close relationship with our Father God. And lastly but not least, Jesus as our resurrected King has triumphed over the grave and has conquered death. As his children, we will inherit eternal life and live forever with him in his kingdom that will never spoil, end, or fade. Jesus, being God Almighty in the flesh, had the power to lay down his life and the power to take it up again. Jesus promises eternal life to everyone who comes to him for salvation and reconciliation. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? If we believe this, my friends, We will be granted everlasting life and we will reign with our Lord Jesus Christ forever. Easter is a time for us, for those of us who have have, uh, given our lives to Jesus. It is a celebration because of what he has done for us in his death and his resurrection. Eternal life waits for us and that's something we can rejoice over. And for those who might be listening today who have never asked Jesus to be their Savior, I want you to know today that God offers you forgiveness 
reconciliation, and eternal life. Surrender your will to him. Ask him to forgive you of your sins and commit to follow him. I would implore you today to be reconciled to God. Today could be the first day of the rest of your life where you become a child of God, renewed in your spirit and are granted the gift of everlasting life. Romans chapter 10, and th uh, verse 10 and 13 says this, For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, made just as if you never sinned. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Would you bow with me in prayer? Jesus, we just want to thank you for Easter. We thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for our sins, for paying the full price, the full penalty of our sins are, has been paid by you, Lord. All you ask, God, is that we submit our lives to you, that we ask you to be our Savior and our, and our King, and we believe in our heart that you are who you say you are. You are the Son of the living God, God in the flesh. So Lord, today, maybe there's someone out there that's never surrendered their heart to you. If that's you today, you can give your life to Jesus right now. You can pray this prayer. Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. Jesus, I ask you, O Lord, to come into my life, to wash away my sin. I see that you died on the cross for my sins. I'm willing to change, Lord. I'm willing to surrender my life to you and to follow you. Would you be my Savior, Lord, today? If you prayed that prayer in your heart, the Bible says that if you, that if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, that you will be saved. If you prayed that prayer today, you can call me at Hillside Community Church where I encourage you to talk to another uh, believer in Jesus. And Lord, for those that are Christians out there that are celebrating this beautiful day of your resurrection, I, I just pray, Lord, that you would strengthen them, Lord, encourage them, Lord, to walk in a way that is honoring to you. And we celebrate your, your resurrection, Jesus. You are risen. You are risen, Lord. And because of that, we rejoice. You've given, us, uh, you've given us forgiveness, reconciliation, and eternal life. And we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Easter, everyone. I pray that God's blessing would be upon you this wonderful day. Amen.